All right, everybody. It's time. The time has come for us to do our History Mama. That's right. This is the part of the show where we sing a silly song. No, I'm just kidding. This is the part of the show where you learn about something in history that you didn't know about, okay? And today, we are doing a very special History Mama. So, hello and welcome all of my current live and future YouTube not live viewers. My name is Demon Mama and this is History Mama. History Mama is a special segment on the Demon Mama show where I talk about a piece of history that I think is very important and I give a sort of oral retelling of that event to the best of my ability. Now, I am no historian. I am just an amateur who appreciates history. But there are events in history that I think are very important for us to pay attention to. My goal in these segments is to plant the seed of knowledge in your head so that you can nurture it if you so desire. And I think that when you get into these, um, that you'll uh, appreciate it and you will indeed want to uh, uh, want to uh, nurture that. Um, so uh, I do a lot of history on my channel in general, but history mamas are a little bit special because I usually bring in the assistance of my re of my friends who are researchers or my team researcher in order to get the most information that we possibly can. And um, for this particular one, for this month, I've been doing a whole bunch of history mama episodes specifically about queer history in America. It's Pride Month, after all. And I think that queer history is one of the things that we know the least about. Most, even queer people, find themselves alienated and distanced from their history. And I think it's very important that we change that. And the way that we change that is by telling these stories, by sharing these stories, and by encouraging one another to pursue the stories of queer history that none of us remember or know except for those who do and you have to seek that out sometimes so that's what i'm going to do here today today we are going to be talking about the compton cafeteria riot now uh there are a number of moments now this month i should say this month i previously covered stonewall stonewall which is largely considered to be the uh sort of inception of the modern concept of pride um sometimes uh there is sort of a, a lot of a lot of uh the stonewall uprising is attributed to a uh drag queen by the name of marcia p johnson um sometimes marcia is referred to as a trans woman but marcia didn't refer to herself that way so i i usually don't uh but marcia did use a seemingly all pronouns um so uh the reality of America, and I said this at the beginning of my Stonewall history, History Mama, which you can find on the channel under the History Mama playlist, um, it, the, the reality of the history of uh, queer people in America is one of persecution. And that is just undeniably true. At every single era of American history, there has been a disgusting level of hatred and persecution directed at queer people. And um, most of the time, this has been backed by the state. So the U.S. government has been more than willing to engage in this. When we were talking about Stonewall, we talked about how police raids were so common at Stonewall that they literally had signs up that said, this property is raided by police. Uh, be careful and just be aware that we get raided all the time. They literally posted signs for people to that to do that um and while stonewall even though it's heavily attributed with pride uh was sort of the pivotal moment for a lot of like gay bars and gay subculture the compton cafeteria riot which was predominantly led by trans people is also incredibly incredibly influential and should not be forgotten and uh, let me just uh, get you, let me just bring this up real quick. Okay. So here we go. 
The year is 1966, okay? So we're going back. And, and as you can tell, the 60s were a spicy time. After all, Stonewall also occurred in the 60s. Um, the Stonewall riots occurred in uh, 1969. So Compton's Cafeteria Riot uh, happened in 1966, three years before Stonewall. Yet it is often forgotten. A lot of people don't know about it. Um, but let me just talk about, let me set things up for you. So, throughout the early 1900s, the state of, of affairs for queer people was not very good. In the 50s and early 60s, there was a massive government purge of gay or suspected gay or suspected effeminate or suspected transsexual um, or suspected cross-dressers from uh, federal jobs. And and. I'm talking a lot of people. In fact, um, we're we're talking hundred like like thousands upon thousands. I I think the estimates for people who lost their jobs during these purges was somewhere in the ballpark of three hundred thousand over the course of the fifties and sixties. And if you were outed as gay, you would be outcast. It is just you would lose your job. Jobs were not friendly to this. You would be outcast from your family. Um, in some cases, you would be targeted and beaten. This was an incredibly common occurrence. And that was only in the 60s. Okay? Not that long ago. Um, and people tend to forget this a little bit. And it makes me sad. But if you're wondering why the 60s seemed to be such a pivotal point for civil rights in general, both for racial civil rights and for sex and gender civil rights, well, there you have it. The years leading up to the 60s were ones of brutal repression, often at the hands of the state, being justified by moral panics, whether it was McCarthyism, whether it was a mixture of McCarthyism and the idea of, of needing to preserve moral purity because gay people are impure. It doesn't matter. Those moral panics fueled purges and horrific repression of queer people in America. And it is very sad. And I know this is a heavy topic, but it has to be talked about, okay? It really does need to be talked about. So that brings us to August of 1966. And where we are, where, where we're going to talk about is a district of San Francisco, which was called the Tenderloin. The Tenderloin is a district of a city where there's lots of corruption and vice, drugs, alcohol, prostitution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the Tenderloin specifically of San Francisco was a ghetto for queer people. It was a ghetto for trans people. It was a a ghetto for drug addicts who had no options at that time. And uh the Tenderloin district of San Francisco is specifically unique in that m at the time most of the buildings there were single single room occupancy like single occupancy hotel rooms they were used for prostitution that was a huge amount uh you got lost in the tenderloin first time in cali that makes sense um but uh but yeah in the 1960s most of the tenderloin district of, of San Francisco was single occupancy hotel rooms. They were used for prostitution. They were used for drugs. This was what that uh, neighborhood was made up of. And in the early 1960s, San Francisco was undergoing a huge, huge process of, of urban renewal where they were gentrifying neighborhoods, redoing them, and they basically turned the tenderloin completely into a gay ghetto. So... It was very hard for you to get housing in the 60s if you were gay. If you were trans, there's you're you're just it's not going to happen. Um, and as a result, a bunch of businesses started popping up that were either by chance or by intention serving predominantly gay and queer people. Um, gay bars started to show up in the 60s uh, that were friendly to trans people. Some of them run by the mafia, interestingly, which we talked about in the last one. Um, we talked about that uh, in our last one, which is that a lot of gay bars were run by the mafia. And the mafia wasn't really good to gay people. 
but they provided a space for them because they were willing to, they were already engaging in illegal action. So they said, why not? Why not take the money of the gay people? Yeah, the inclusive mafia. Well, they weren't, they didn't do it out of the goodness of their hearts. They just saw an opportunity. Yeah, they saw an opportunity. And and by the way, they also blackmailed people. They would uh, they would blackmail wealthy gay people or wealthy trans people and say, hey, if you don't pay up, we're going to we're going to out you. So, yeah, it wasn't out of the goodness of their hearts. It was out of a uh, out of a disrespect for the state. So this is what led to the creation of uh, a, a loose group of people known as the Street Queens of Tenderloin. These were cross-dressers, drag queens, and transsexuals. And keep in mind that the 1960s was when, in America, we started to see the first um, surgery, like SRS surgeries um, in America, the first ones. Now, in Europe, they've been being done since the 1930s, um, thanks to a guy named Magnus Hirschfeld, who we have talked about many times in, um, in, in our, on our show. Magnus Hirschfeld was a Jewish, a German Jewish doctor whose, uh, school was destroyed, was one of the first places destroyed by the Nazis. It set back trans healthcare for, uh, literally a century. Um because the nazis destroyed his school which was tr was was kindly and understandingly treating and caring for trans people and it's one of the saddest pieces of the 1900s history for trans people now again his his teachings had already started to spread across europe so europe had been doing some trans surgeries for a while but america had not been this only started around the 60s that it was even possible to start getting Things like uh, hormone therapy towards the late 60s and early 70s and things like SRS and breast augmentations and stuff like that happened in the 60s. As a result, there were sort of um, these these groups of, of, of trans people who would stick together and those became known as the street queens of, uh, of the tenderloin. Make sense? A lot of them were prostitutes. And you might wonder... Well, God, all these trans people, why are they all prostitutes? Well, that's because it was basically impossible to get a job if you were trans. Unless you were lucky enough to perfectly pass without hormones, without laser hair removal, without surgeries, you would not be able to get, um, we, you would not be able to get, uh, any work. You would not be able to get hired. Yes, lots of lots of trans people still do sex work for the exact same reasons, Okay. We're not going to deal with that shit right now. Um, and, uh, of course, um, of course, some people, uh, would, would just live their lives as men. They would live their lives as men and then they would cross dress on the weekends or whatever. But keep in mind that would put them in a very precarious position that would put them in a, a position where, um, if at any moment anyone found out about their behavior, they would be completely and utterly outcast, could be the subject of violence. And by the way, some of that hasn't changed. Some of this still holds to this day. Um, but yeah. Um, and another thing, so a lot of the work that trans people who didn't want to hide or be in the closet would do is that they could become exotic dancers or they could become singers where they would be able to use lots of makeup or they could become prostitutes so it makes sense that a lot of the trans people would 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 gather together in the tenderloin in this in this in this neighborhood that was sort of an impromptu gay ghetto that had lots of gender non-conforming people and lots of vices going on in general and during this time gay bars which there was no such thing as like uh, they wouldn't be named a gay bar but bars that were regularly um visited by gay people would become the target of police raids. This was incredibly common, uh, heavily documented, um, heavily, heavily documented, the amount of, uh, of raids that were done, because at the time, um, homosexual behavior was considered uh, 
a a like public basically public indecency or disturbing the peace and so what would happen a lot of the times is that police would literally disguise themselves as just a normal person they would go undercover into a bar and they would offer to buy drinks for other men at the bar and if the dude would 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 accept if the guy gets offered a random drink by some random dude and he accepts cuffed arrested recorded and arrested that was something that happened all the time. Literal entrapment. That was, that was, this is documented. You, there are public documents that refer to this going on, to these tactics being used. In fact, when we covered Stonewall, there were four undercover cops doing just that in Stonewall when the Stonewall Rebellion broke out. Horrible. There would be cops that would go into these bars and they would wait until they saw people dancing together. They would see men and women dancing with one another, uh, you know, uh, you know, men dancing with men and women dancing with women. And then they would signal to their guys, all right, it's time. And the raid and the police that were hiding outside would burst in and they would arrest all the people who were dressing, who were dancing together. Because it was literally at the time, slow dancing with somebody of the same sex was illegal, even in private. That was, it was illegal in private. Wild. Yeah, pretty bad. And one of the gay bars and restaurants that was popular in the Tenderloin of San Francisco was a place called Compton's Cafeteria. And the owners of Compton's Cafeteria were not allies. They did not like gay people. But because they were located in the gay neighborhood, um, nonetheless, there would be a lot of queer people who went to the cafeteria quite a lot and it was considered uh one of the safest locations because of how many people would go there not because of the owners because the owners would regularly call the police in fact they would call the police and, and there are recorded calls of them citing female impersonation as a reason to call the cops even though and this was one of the safest this was considered one of the safest ones in the area even with that, even with owners that would call and, and, and report female impersonation to get these people arrested. That's wild, isn't it? And I think we've got an image right here so we can show this. Yeah, we do. Let me bring this up for you so you can get an idea of what it looked like. Here you go. Look at this. Here's an here's a old school photo. Let's take a look at it, shall we? There you go. Look at that. Compton's Cafeteria. There it is. Let's put a let's put a visual to this story. Look at that. Wow. Wild, huh? There it is, right over there. This is where it all went down. Look at that. Incredible. So now you know what it looks like. You are looking at a photograph of trans history. Interesting, huh? Anyway, so in 1965, two individuals by the name of Adrian Ravarar, Ravarur and Billy Garrison founded a group called Vanguard. I know some of you in chat are going to get real excited when you hear that word, Vanguard. Cool, right? They founded a group called Vanguard, which was the first gay youth liberation group. And Ravarar, Ravarar, I always say, I always say that the name wrong. Adrian Ravarar was, when he founded this group, a, a young gay ex-priest who had left the Mormon church over homophobia. Kind of kind of wild so you had a priest who left the priesthood of the mormon church because of how much homophobia there was in the church and this guy went on to found a gay youth liberation group and they published even they even published a magazine look at this we can we've got we've got images of the fucking magazine look at this wow look at that bam vanguard and you have these beautiful individuals smooching each other and the little price of 25 cents 
Look at that. This is this is the real cover of one of the magazines that they published. Incredible. And uh, so, yeah. So this group was looking for uh, places to gather, you know, where they would be able to safely gather and organize for gay liberation. And uh, first they aimed at a church. There was a church nearby called the Glide Memorial Church which was a United Methodist church. Um, they were very, very conservative early on, the United Methodists, but uh, this particular church um, uh, happened to have a, in, a, a very influential leader named Cecil Williams, who believed that uh, basically that there was a need to reconcile re the religious groups with gay people. So you had Cecil Williams, the pastor of the Glide Memorial Church, talking with the with Vanguard, with Adrian Ravaror and Billy Garrison of Vanguard, and they and and offered a space for them, a priest who was trying to resolve this this horrible homophobia at the time, and what Vanguard did out based out of the out of the church out of the Glide Memorial Church was protest. They would protest businesses that wouldn't serve gay people. They would uh, do like sort of sit-ins and things like that. They would um, they would go and if there were if there were civil rights movements or workers movements that weren't talking about queer issues, they would show up there. Um, they uh, there was a whole lot of that sort of thing. So they were very very loud. They were very very active. Yeah. Yeah, this is in the 60s. Yep. And what ended up happening was the church believed in what they were doing so strongly that uh Cecil Will Re that the Reverend Cecil Williams um offered to sponsor Vanguard. So this church and this pastor believed in what they were doing. And they organized a picket of Compton's Cafeteria. Compton's Cafeteria, which was one of the safest places for trans people that still regularly called the cops specifically on trans people so that trans people would end up getting locked in men's prisons where their lives would become hell. That's why they were picketing. Okay? And this is where it gets wild. Okay. So one night after these these sort of plans of picketing had occurred, um a Compton's worker called the police claiming that a bunch of female impersonators were being too rowdy and raucous. And that's basically a death sentence. You are you if you call the cops at this time in history, if you call the cops on some trans people, who, and you call them female impersonators, those those people, are, their lives are going to be over if they get caught. You are genuinely threatening their life. So they did. And nobody knows who it was, or at least we've been unable to figure out who it was, but the police made an attempt to arrest a trans woman who resisted arrest and threw a cup of coffee in the cop's face. And the cops, of course, responded. And this resulted with other patrons throwing things at the cops. Sugar, sugar things. They were flipping tables. They were, they were throwing chairs at the police. Um, and uh, the windows of the place ended up broken in the scuffle. And the police backed out of Compton's cafeteria. And by this point, people had already caught wind. And of course... Vanguard had already been planning to picket this place. So there was a lot of people in the area that already knew what was going on. They already knew that this shit was happening. So it made it stink very quickly. And a crowd started uh, to arrive. A crowd of gay people, a crowd of locals started to arrive. Does this sound familiar? Sounds really familiar to what happened at Stonewall, isn't it? That basically... Someone tried to arrest somebody for being trans. 
or being gay and the local people there resisted like just spontaneously a bunch of random people some of them might know each other some of them might not know each other but they saw someone being oppressed by the cops and they signed they got involved and outside uh people were getting angry because of course the cops were trying to load these groups of trans women mostly trans people not just trans women but trans people in general into the paddy wagons and the crowd was really not having it the crowd is like how dare you you're arresting us you're arresting these women for who they are they weren't doing anything wrong they were just enjoying their coffee and you're arresting them and you're sending them to their deaths so the crowd was understandably angry and they trashed the streets they trashed the streets they trashed the restaurant the restaurant got its windows bashed open and of course eventually the police did get under control did get this get did get the riot under control but guess what the next day compton's cafeteria installed new windows and the first thing that happened was that the community got together and picketed Compton's cafeteria with Vanguard. And they smashed the windows out again. The, the day after, a giant picket happened and they bashed the shit out of the windows. And of course, the police got that particular uprising under control again. You know, in this typical manner, the police beating the shit out of everyone, arresting a ton of people, a ton of trans people went to prison, a ton of gay people went to prison. Those people may have even died in prison. There's no way to know who it even was. It would be almost impossible to track this information down. But it wasn't the end. Because the, the word of the Compton cafeteria riot spread very quickly. And shortly afterwards, Vanguard, the very group that, that organized the, pro, the next day's protest, hosted an event that was called a street sweep. And I'm going to show you an image of this because it's kind of cool. These images are pretty cool. All right, ready? And this was a protest. Let me show you. Here we go. Ready? Look at this. This is, these are some of the street queens, as you can see. There's some of the street queens here. And they're in association with Vanguard. Look, you can even see on the back, in the back, to Vietnam in turmoil. Vietnam in turmoil, 80 minutes explosive. And they are sweeping the streets. And here's another picture of them. Here you go. Market Street needs a cleanup. All the trash is, I can't see what that says. This is a Vanguard community project. And this was a symbolic me me uh, measure. What they were trying to say what their messaging was, was that instead of actually sweeping the streets, the police were trying to sweep the trash, meaning queer people, away forever. That was what they were trying, that was what the symbolism was. And that's what they talked about when they were interviewed by the news. They said, we're, street we're sweeping the streets because the cops are trying to sweep us off the streets. They're trying to get rid of us. They're trying to kill us. They're trying to force us into the dark. And that was what the street sweeps at that time were all about. And um, they had they made a lot of waves. As it turns out, they were able to, because of this, because of the shock of the riot, they got their name out there. And interestingly, things got a little bit better. In 1968, the National Transsexual Counseling Unit, which was a peer-run support group that was supported to some degree by elements of the state, was formed. And overseeing that group was the San Francisco Police Department liaison to the homophile community. But... For all of its flaws and for all of the disgusting implications there. Um, for all the disgusting implications there, they did have some success. 
and they were able to reduce police violent violence against the queer community over the next couple of years. However, in the 70s, in the early 70s, in 1973, the SFPD riot police raided the National Transsexual Counseling Unit offices and attempted to frame Sergeant Blackstone on drug charges by planting marijuana in his desk. So the one guy, the guy, the one good cop, remember how we say there's no good cops? The one cop who tried to do good things, who, success, who successfully uh, lowered the violence being done on the queer community, Sergeant Elliot Blackstone, the liaison to the homophile community, was arrested, roughed up, and, and framed with on marijuana charges. And even though he avoided criminal prosecution, unfortunately, he lost his position as a community relations officer and was instead pushed into an incredibly low-ranking position in the cops, and he retired two years later. Remember, remember how I've talked about this before? I've talked about how this is symbolic. Uh, Silence says, Sergeant Blackstone apparently was very serious about trying to help out trans folks at the time. I found claims that he would raise money at his church to help pay for HRT for trans folks. That's amazing. That's really amazing. And yeah, there are, there are people like it. But notice what happened. Notice what happened. Uh, to be clear, the homophile movement back then was the assimilationist queer movement. Yes, the homophile movement was trying to change the name of homosexuality to homophilia because they wanted to blend in and be nice. And yes, I know. I, that's why I said there's some bad implications in having a transsexual liaison to the homophile community. That's problematic, but it was it was better than it was slightly. And yes, fuck assimilation. I agree. And now the next major news, just so we know, is that in 2017, the city of Fra San Francisco finally recognized Compton's transgender cultural district, the world's first legally recognized transgender district. 2017. After in 1973, the guy who tried to make things better got completely owned. Fuck the police. Fuck the police. The police are not the friends of queer people. They, they are not. The, the, the institution of the police do not protect queer people in this country. W only other queer people protect queer people in this country. That is it. That is it. So yes, while we do now have the Compton's Transgender Cultural District. Um, unfortunately, uh, we live in a time in which trans people are being targeted. Trans people are in some states, like Arkansas and Tennessee, are literally being driven back into the closet and being litigated and legislated out of public life. I have a very, very predominantly LGBT audience. And we're at 94% of people who didn't know anything about Compton's cafeteria riot. And this is not to shame anybody. There is no shame involved in this. I just want to point out that one of the most influential events in trans history, a an example of, of the most disgusting state overreach against queer people, 92% of other... LGBT people, which I mean, my, my, my audience isn't totally LGBT, but a lot of people are, and they're at least familiar of it. The first time I've ever heard the name of this event. I know nobody knows about it. So here's where I ask you a favor. Okay. Let me ask you a favor. Okay. This video is going to go up very shortly as a history mama, but you've already heard it. The story of the Compton cafeteria riot and what it's called is in your head. Share it. You don't even need to share my video. Just share the story. I want our society to never 
be able to forget the stories of the queer people that came before us. Forgetting dooms us to repeat the past, okay? So, my lovely imps, please, please, listen to me and tell someone else about this story. You can literally just bring it up to random people. I just want this story to be out there to be remembered. And I'm going to have a video on it, which is great. So that'll be one more video into the archives of the likelihood that this event won't be forgotten. But I think it's really important that we remember. And I want to talk about something else also while we're doing this, okay? Listen, listen, everybody. One of the biggest problems that faces queer people and that we don't talk about very much is censorship and the destruction of history. There are enormous swaths of, of queer history that we only know are there because of their absence. Do, do you know what that's like? Can you imagine if there was a part of your brain that you knew wasn't there because every time you tried to go to that place, you there was nothing there. You knew there was something there, but there was emptiness. Can you imagine that? That is what has happened to our history. Queer history has these giant gaping holes in it, and we don't know what was there. All we know is that it's missing. And I want to stop that. I want that to stop happening. And, the, and it is one of the things we talk about a lot how there's not a whole lot that individuals, you know, we, I mean, it's not that there's not a whole lot that individuals can do. It, individuals can do lots of stuff. But we spend a lot of time talking about systemic issues. We spend a lot of time talking about systemic analysis, all this sort of stuff. But this is one of the things that every individual can contribute to. I'm serious. By remembering the story, by telling the story to somebody else, by recording the story, by saving a copy of the Wikipedia page and archiving it, by telling the story on your blog, by talking about it on Twitter, you can ensure that this history doesn't disappear. I'm serious. I'm very serious. Archival, uh, oral retellings, keeping that history is something that anybody can do. Anybody. And it's important that we do it. Because otherwise, those holes in our memory will get bigger and bigger and bigger, and we will be left feeling alone. But we're not alone. It is very easy as a queer person in America to feel alone. It is very easy to feel like everyone in the world hates you. That, there is, that, that you are a new phenomenon that is unwanted. But you are not. You are not unwanted, first of all. And secondly, you are not new. There have been trans people moving in this world for as long as there have been humans, even if we don't have the history to remember them all. But we can change that. We literally, literally can change that. And you don't, you don't have to be trans yourself. You don't have to be gay yourself. You can be straight. But if you look and you see, oh my God, there's beauty in this. There's wonder in this. Please tell the story. Remember the story. Share the story. Back up these stories. I'm serious. We will not be forgotten. 